Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Today we begin a two-part series on the Christological controversies of the 4th century. Our focus for this episode is the conflict between Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria, and his presbyter Arius. You may be surprised to learn that Arius was not some youthful outsider spouting off obvious heresy. Rather than depending on what modern historians and biased apologists say, we'll depend on ancient historians and the surviving letters from Arius, Alexander, and Constantine to reconstruct what really happened. You may be surprised what we find. Here now is episode 494, Early Church History, Part 12, Arius and Alexander, of Alexandria. Bishop Demetrius, if you recall him, he had been a bishop at the time of Origen. And I like to draw a little parallel. In Alexandria, Egypt, Bishop Demetrius exerted his authority over Origen, the ascetic scholar. Origen, as you recall, never wore shoes, never slept in a bed. He denied himself physical pleasure. He was an ascetic, and he was an incredibly intelligent man. He was a scholar. Eventually, he got ordained as a presbyter, uh, but he had to go outside of his area to do that. And when Demetrius found out about it, he got furious. And eventually, Origen just left. He just moved out of the city. And Demetrius lost, like, the number one Christian celebrity in his city, because, you know, they couldn't agree. So it was in the, that was in the third century, so it was in the fourth century that Bishop Alexander was the authoritarian bishop seeking to control Christians in the city. Not all necessarily badly motivated, but, you know, that's the way they conceived of their, their role at that time. And he was against Arius, who was an ascetic scholar, also ordained as a presbyter, in Alexandria, Egypt, and the two of them had a serious falling out, and Alexander ended up excommunicating Arius from the church. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What are we talking about? We're talking about the beginning of a controversy that lasted from the year 318 all the way up to the year 381. And today, we're just covering the beginning. We're just going to kind of dip our toes in 325, but not jump in, okay? And we'll come back to that in our next session. Alexander of Alexandria was bishop from 313 to 326 of Alexandria, Egypt. He engaged in several controversies. He argued with a man named Erecentius about when to celebrate Easter. He had a controversy with a bishop named Miletius of Lycopolis, Miletius wouldn't admit to communion those who had denied Christ in the persecution, and Alexander thought he should. Eventually, they established peace with each other. And then Alexander also had controversies. The biggest thing that he's known for is his controversies with Arius. Let's take a look at Arius. Arius was born around 260, give or take, and lived until 336. Uh, When the controversy occurred, He was about 62 years old, an older man at the Council of Nicaea. He was already 70 years old. He's from Libya in Africa. He was ordained as an elder in one of the oldest and most prestigious churches in all of Alexandria. He was, according to one historian, a guy named Sozomen, he was a zealous thinker about doctrine. And Sozomen also says that even Alexander held Arius in high repute since he was a most expert logician. So everyone recognizes that Arius is really smart. He's an ascetic. He has a good reputation. He's a conservative. He's not some random outsider who came up with a new idea. He is part of the the church order. He's in his 60s. He's not a young man. Alvin Lamson likes to make the point that in all the controversies with Arius, Nobody ever accuses him of immorality, of unethical behavior. 
They attack his ideas. They call him insane. But they don't ever say he cheated on his wife or he, I don't know that he had a wife, probably not if he's an ascetic. But like, you know, they don't accuse him of moral failings. So the initial controversy broke out in Alexandria in the year 318 at a conference, a pastor's conference, a clergy meeting that Alexander had, and a historian named Socrates Scholasticus, not the philosopher, uh, but someone who lived centuries and centuries after Socrates, a philosopher, he wrote the following. He, Alexander, in the fearless exercise of his functions for the instruction and government of the church, attempted one day in the presence of the presbytery and the rest of his clergy to explain with this is the best part. Perhaps too philosophical minuteness, the great theological mystery, the unity of the Holy Trinity. Now, I do want to point out that Socrates is writing in, well, he, he lived from 380 to 439, so he's writing in the 5th century. So by the 5th century, there's an established doctrine of the Trinity, and so he's kind of re retrojecting that back into the initial controversy. More likely what was the issue is that Alexander, the bishop, has all his clergy there, and he's explaining how the Father and the Son are one. How are they unified between Father and Son? The Holy Spirit wasn't really much of a conversation point until later. Arius didn't like it. A certain one of the presbyters, Socrates goes on, under his jurisdiction, whose name was Arius, possessed of no inconsiderable logical acumen. That's a really big compliment from a hostile witness imagining that the bishop was subtly teaching the same view of this subject as Sibelius, the Libyan, took the opposite opinion to that of the Libyan, and as he thought, vigorously responded to what was said by the bishop. If, said he, the father begat the son, he that was begotten had a beginning of existence, and from this it is evident that there was a time when the son was not. It therefore necessarily follows that he had his substance from nothing. And once again, this is a historian, but he's writing a century after the events have occurred. But he's giving us the best insight we can get uh, as far as um, what happened at this particular event. And, well, there might be other letters and so on that we could look at, but he gives us a, a window into what was happening. And I do appreciate how seemingly unbiased he is in his description of this, he makes clear that it was Alexander that was speculating, that was perhaps with too philosophical minuteness describing something that was really beyond his level of description. And here's Arius, a super smart guy that's just like, what do you mean the son's eternal? They're not brothers, they're father and son. If he's begotten, he has a beginning. He's, he's very keen logically, and he starts to disagree, and he starts to teach. And this is a key phrase here, that there was a time when the Son was not. So there was a beginning to the Son of God. Alexander the bishop says the Son is eternal. Arius says that's impossible, he's begotten. The only eternal one is the Father. So that you understand the, the controversy. Word came back to Alexander that Arius had disagreed and was teaching this in his church, and we get a debate. I think this is interesting, too. So this is another historian named Sozomen, also from the 5th century. He writes, Those who heard these doctrines advanced blamed Alexander for not opposing the innovations at variance with doctrine, but this bishop deemed it more advisable to leave each party to the free discussion of doubtful topics so that by persuasion, rather than by force, they might cease from contention. Hence, he sat down as a judge with some of his clergy and led both sides into a discussion. But it happened on this occasion, as is generally the case in a strife of words, that each party claimed the victory. How many debates have you <laughs> heard about where both sides say they won? Arius defended his assertions, but the others contended that the Son is consubstantial and co-eternal with the Father. The council was convened a second time. So we had a second debate. And the same points contested, but they came to no agreement amongst themselves. During the debate, Alexander seemed to incline first to one party and then to the others. Finally, 
However, he declared himself in favor of those who affirmed that the Son was consubstantial and co-eternal with the Father. And he commanded Arius to receive this doctrine and to reject the former opinions. Arius, however, would not be persuaded to compliance, and many of the bishops and clergy considered his statement of doctrine to be correct. This is another astounding statement where it says, many of the bishops and clergy considered his statement, Arius' statement of doctrine, to be correct. Most textbooks are going to call this whole controversy, this whole issue that erupts in 318 and continues on for another 60 years, they were going to call it the Arian controversy. This is to retroject later labels and really propaganda into the way we talk about this event. This is not Arius coming up with a new doctrine. Does he come up with new ideas? Yes, he does. But he's responding to Alexander, who he perceives is coming up with a new way of talking about father and son that is unacceptable. So it's more properly called, and the textbook that I use is uh, the one by Joseph Lynch, he makes this point, it's more properly called the Trinitarian Controversy. It's not the Arian Controversy, it's the Trinitarian. Arius was not a very significant person in the controversy if you look at the whole period of time. He's just the guy that had the initial confrontation and got kicked out. People who argue Arius' position 30, 40, 50 years later, they don't even know who Arius is. So you can't call it the Arian controversy. So what happened after the debates? Well, Alexander decided, no, we're going to stick with the son as being co-eternal. He had an, a council of bishops to get together, had Arius attend, presented Arius with a confession of faith, told him to sign it. Arius said no. Alexander said, you're excommunicated. To be excommunicated means you're not allowed to attend any church in the entire region of Alexandria, not just the city, but the entire region of Northeast Africa. He has a reach, Alexander and the Alexandrian bishops, that goes all the way down to Libya and to other regions around the area of Alexandria. When Arius got kicked out, 89 others left with him including clergy, presbyters, and uh, seven presbyters and 12 deacons. Then, after Alexander kicks out Arius, he says, I have to write a letter to all the different churches, to all the clergy. So he does that, and he explains why he excommunicated Arius. And this is what's called an encyclical, a letter that is circulated throughout the churches, sent out by a bishop or someone in authority. Arius wrote letters to influential bishops because from his local situation, there's no recourse. Alexander is the top guy. In fact, at this time, he was already called the Pope. Not of Rome, the Pope of Alexandria. They're already using this terminology in the early 4th century for Alexander. So Arius has no recourse. The only thing he can do is move. But he's in his 60s, he doesn't want to move. So he writes to other bishops of sufficient standing, and he asks them, can you talk to my bishop? He kicked me out of the church. And he you know, basically lays out his case. He gets a hearing from Eusebius of Caesarea, the church historian, and another Eusebius of Nicomedia. Nicomedia was a very significant city at this time. It had been basically the empire, the Roman Empire's capital before Constantinople was Nicomedia. Functionally a capital, Rome was still the official capital. And this is then when they say to Arius, you need to write a nice letter to your bishop. Explain yourself. So we have this letter of Arius written to Alexander explaining himself. First hand, eyewitness testimony of what was going on at that time. And this is what Arius says. To our blessed Pope and Bishop Alexander, the presbyters and deacons send health in the Lord. Our faith from our forefathers, which also we have learned from thee, blessed Pope, is this. We acknowledge one God, alone, ingenerate, alone, everlasting, alone, unbegun, alone, true, alone, having immortality, alone, wise, alone, good, 
alone sovereign judge governor and providence of all unalterable and unchangeable just and good god of law and prophets and new testament who begat an only begotten son before eternal times this is really the key word this word begat here the only begotten son before eternal times through whom he has made both the ages and the universe and begat him not in semblance but in truth that he made him subsist at his own will unalterable and unchangeable, perfect creature of God. This is another buzzword, calling Jesus a creature rather than eternal, but not as one of the creatures. He's not like every other created thing. Offspring, but not as one of the things begotten, nor as Valentinus pronounced that the offspring of the Father was an issue, nor as Manichaeus taught that the offspring was a portion of the Father, one in essence, or as Sibelius, dividing the monad, speaks of son and father, nor is Hierakas of one torch from another. What has Arius just done? Hmm. He listed off a bunch of heretics. Heretics are Christians you disagree with, just for the record. Valentinus, he taught that the offspring of the father was an issue. Or Manichaeus, there's another heretic. He taught this other doctrine about the offspring. And this phrase, one in essence, he's like, that's a heresy. We don't believe one in essence. One in essence becomes the buzzword and the center of orthodoxy after this whole thing. But at the time of Arius writing this letter, he could confidently hand wave this idea of one in, of substance or one in of essence as a heretical, dismissed, illegal expression that you wouldn't use to describe the father and the son. And then he also mentions Sibelius, and that's really the one that he's worried about. He thought, according to Socrates, the historian, Arius thought that Alexander sounded like Sibelius. Sibelius taught the father was the son. There was no distinction between them. It's the idea of modalism, that there are different modes or aspects to the one God, not different persons. The, the language, incidentally, of personhood, which is used typically to talk about the Trinity today, didn't yet exist. They just didn't have it. So nobody does three who's and one what. Like, that's not a move you can make. Nobody talks about person as distinct from being. It's just not around yet. Okay, that's later terminology that will be invented. Uh, but at this time, one in essence is actually a heretical teaching. It's associated with, in particular, Sibelius, who believes the father is of the same substance as the son because they are really the same being. And uh, so then he goes on, he talks about Hierakas, another heretic. Arius sees himself as an insider who's trying to help his bishop, that he knows he's smarter than, to not fall into heresy. And the bishop is just kind of got like one move, which is, you're out of here. And he just keeps doing it to Arius. And Arius is, is trying to gently bring him along, and it's not working. So uh, he goes on, nor that he was before, was afterward generated or new created into a son, as thou too, blessed Pope, in the midst of the church and in session, hast often condemned. He's like, look, man, you used to condemn all these heresies. I'm condemning these heresies. I'm part of your church, man. But as we say, at the will of God, created before times and before ages, and gaining life and being from the Father who gave subsistence to his glories together with him. For the Father did not, in giving to him the inheritance of all things, deprive himself of what he has ingenerately in himself, for he is the fountain of all things. Thus there are three subsistences, and God, being the cause of all things, is unbegun. That's another big word for Arius. The Father is unbegun, and altogether soul, but the Son being begotten, apart from time, by the Father, and being created and founded before ages was not before his generation. There it is again, the idea that he was not, he did not exist before his generation. But being begotten apart from time before all things alone was made to subsist by the Father, for he is not eternal or co-eternal or co-unoriginate with the Father, nor has he his being together with the Father, as some speak of relations, introducing two ingenerate beings, beginnings, but God is before all things as being monad and beginning of all. Wherefore also he is before the Son, as we have learned also from thy preaching in the midst of the church. So far then is from God he has being and glories and life 
and all things are delivered unto him. In such sense is God his origin, for he is above him as being his God and before him. Whew, that was kind of a long reading. You'll be interested to know that Arius was allegedly, according to his enemies, a public relations genius. A, a guy who, who kind of like just wrote against a lot of Christians who lived before him, a man named Photius, quoted another one named Philostorgius as saying, so this is like hearsay of hearsay centuries later, but what they said is that Arius put down his beliefs to rhyme and meter and turn them into songs that were sung by sailors and millers and travelers on the road. So although what I just read to you may have seemed a tad dry and repetitive, I assure you that Arius was able to get his message out and sound the alarm. Alexander, in response to this, did not accept him back into the church. He wrote more letters, and he wrote to other bishops, and he said, don't take this Arius. He's bad news. His ideas are wrong. Let me prove to you that the Son is eternal. He doubles down. He gets his verses together, and he continues to argue his case. Here is a sample of Alexander of Alexandria, who wrote a letter to Alexander of Constantinople. I guess they were short on names, huh? <laughs> to the most reverend and like-minded brother Alexander, Alexander sends greeting in the Lord. The ambitious and avaricious will of wicked men is always wont to lay snares against those churches which seem greater by various pretexts attacking the ecclesiastical piety of such. These guys were smart people, right? I mean, it's incredible how they write. For incited by the devil, uh-oh, who works in them, he's talking about Arius, to the lust of that which is set before them, and throwing away all religious scruples, they trample underfoot the fear of the judgment of God. Concerning which things I, who suffer, have thought it necessary to show to your piety, in order that you may be aware of such men, lest any of them presume to set foot in your diocese, whether by themselves or by others. For these sorcerers know how to use hypocrisy to carry out their fraud. Then he goes on, building for themselves dens of thieves, they hold their assemblies in them unceasingly, night and day, directing their calumnies against Christ and against us. For since they call in question all pious and apostolical doctrine, after the manner of the Jews, they have constructed a workshop for contending against Christ, denying the Godhead of our Savior and preaching that He is only the equal of all others. And now, indeed, they drag us before the tribunals of the judges by intercourse with silly and disorderly women, whom they have led into error. At another time, they cast opprobrium and infamy upon the Christian religion, their young maidens disgracefully wandering about every village and street, nay, even Christ's indivisible tunic, which his executioners were unwilling to divide, these wretches have dared to rend. For those inventors of stupid fables say that we who turn away with aversion from the impious and unscriptural blasphemy against Christ of those who speak of his coming from the things which are not, assert that there are two unbegottens. So he wrote this letter and many other letters like it to defend his eternal son position. Now, I want to be careful here. A lot of what comes up in the debate are quotations and, and writings of origin of Alexandria. Of course, Origen of Alexandria was influenced by Clement of Alexandria, who was influenced by Philo of Alexandria. You can kind of see the march from Logos and Philo, which is a, called a begotten of God. But the Logos of Philo is not Jesus. It's nothing to do with, he's not a Christian. Philo's a Jew. So it's just a philosophical idea. It's like, sort of like God's hand through which he's able to create the universe. And Philo believes the Logos is eternal. And in origin, it's clear that he also believed the Logos was eternal. And there were other Christians that believed that God had an internal Logos that he then externalized and it became an independent being. So there's not a lot of clarity on this, but with origin, we have both. The idea that the Son is eternal, 
He even makes a big point of saying, how could he ever not be the father? That's one of Origen's biggest arguments. To say that the son was begotten or came into existence implies that the father had a change. And we know that God cannot change. That's one of his beliefs. That's from Platonism. That's not from the Bible. In the Bible, God changes all the time. And God has emotions in the Bible too, not in Plato. Origen is going to say he's, he's eternal and he's eternally begotten. Alexander is picking up on the eternal side of it, and Arius is picking up on the begotten side of it, and, they're fight, and they both are followers of Origen and his teachings. It's really fascinating how this all played out. So then we had some councils. We had the council in Bithynia in uh, 321. That was called by Eusebius of Nicomedia. Eusebius of Nicomedia is a very influential, important person. In the end... Constantine has him baptize him on his deathbed. Eusebius of Nicomedia. He's not a second-rate guy. And he's fully backing Arius. He also believes the same as Arius that the sun has a beginning. And so the first council that's called outside of Alexandria is in Bithynia, and it's called by Eusebius of Nicomedia, and it agrees that Arius is orthodox. Arius has the correct doctrine. The second council is held in Alexandria, by Alexander, and it confirms that Alexander's right. Big surprise there. Then Constantine, who's just now starting to favor Christianity and get involved, he's just had his battle with the, the Milvian Bridge, or he's, he's about to, somewhere around this time. He hears about this controversy in Alexandria, and he says, we need to settle this. And he writes a letter to both of them. And this is his letter, Constantine to Alexander. Victor, Constantinus, Maximus, Augustus, to Alexander, and Arius. He writes to both of them. How deep a wound did not my ears only but my very heart receive in the report that divisions exist among yourselves, more grievous still than those which continued in that country, so that you, through whose aid I had hoped to procure a remedy for the errors of others, are in a state which needs healing even more than theirs. You're worse than the pagans. You guys fighting with each other. Essentially, this letter is saying, knock it off. It's not that important, whatever it is you're arguing about. Typical emperor response, right? He's like, I don't want to have the whole thing explained to me. I don't really care. Figure it out. Essentially what he's going to say here. Let's read a little more. And yet, having made a careful inquiry into the origin and foundation of these differences, I find the cause to be of truly insignificant character and quite unworthy of such fierce contention. I understand then that the origin of the present controversy is this. When you, Alexander, demanded of the presbyters what opinion they severally maintain respecting a certain passage in the divine law, or rather, I should say, that you asked them something connected with an unprofitable question, then you, Arius, inconsiderately insisted on what ought never to have been conceived at all, or if conceived, should have been buried in profound silence. Hence, it was that a dis dissension arose between you, fellowship was withdrawn, and the holy people rent into diverse parties, no longer preserved the unity of the one body. Now, therefore, do you both exhibit an equal degree of forbearance and receive the advice which your fellow servant righteously gives. He's calling himself your fellow servant. What then is this advice? It was wrong in the first instance to propose such questions as these, Alexander, or to reply to them when propounded, Arius, for those points of discussion which are enjoined by the authority of no law, but rather suggested by the contentious spirit which is fostered by misused leisure, even though they may be intended merely as an intellectual exercise, ought certainly to be confined to the region of our own thoughts and not hastily produced in the popular assemblies, nor unadvisedly entrusted to the general ear. For how very few are there able either accurately to comprehend or adequately to explain subjects so sublime and abstruse in their nature. This is hysterical. I love this letter. Let therefore both the unguarded question and the inconsiderate answer receive your mutual forgiveness. He's telling them to forgive each other. You see that? For the cause of your difference has not been any of the leading doctrines. Look, it's not a big doctrine. It's not a cardinal belief. 
or precepts of the divine law, nor has any new heresy respecting the worship of God arisen among you, you are in truth of one and the same judgment. You may therefore well join in communion and fellowship. It reminds me of a parent that has two kids fighting, and the parent comes, and it's the dad, and he, he slaps both of them on the hand and says, forgive each other, give it back, give me that thing. Stop talking about that. Forgive each Now let's move on. <laughs> sort of like what this letter's doing. Totally doesn't work. It's, it's a great idea. I wish it worked. And in the whole controversy, this is probably like the wisest thing that you can see as far as a response. It's like, guys, this is an abstruse thing, whether he's eternal, whether he's begotten, has a beginning. Like, this is not salvational. Let's not divide over this. It's, and, and besides, it's so complicated, nobody even understands what you're talking about. Before this happened, you'd have people sitting next to each other in church. Some believed he's eternal. Some believe he had a beginning. Some maybe were really smart like Origen and found a way to believe both at the same time, which is, sounds like a contradiction to me, but whatever. Like you had people with different views in the same churches. It wasn't a heresy. We could all worship together. After this, this will be the definitive belief as we build towards the doctrine of the Trinity over time here. So he goes on, to, he calls the, the uh, situation small and insignificant, trifling and foolish verbal differences. That's, what he, that's Constantine's summary of it. And I think if both sides just listen to Constantine, I mean, I, I half love Constantine and I half hate him. You know, like half of the things, you know, there's so much good and so much bad that he did. But I think this is one of the good things he tried to do is just like, guys, let's, let's settle down. Because again, I know the rest of the story afterwards and there was just so much pain and suffering that has been caused by not letting this thing alone or making it into such a big deal. All right, then we have a couple more councils. We have the Council in Alexandria of 324, which is called by a name, man named Hosius of Cordoba, Spain. Hosius is Constantine's closest, most trusted Christian advisor. He's way out there from Spain. By the way, Constantine was a ruler in the western part of the empire before he conquered everyone else and took over the whole thing and became the sole emperor of the entire empire. So he's, he's pulling a lot from the west, but this is an eastern controversy in Alexandria. And the east kind of has a reputation for being a little nerdy. And uh, the west is more practical. Uh, and so he's, he's bringing in this advisor and he's like, all right, Hosius, go down there, bring this letter, read it to them, fix this. Hosius goes down, has a council, he sides with Alexander, he agrees with Alexander, he thinks Alexander's right, and he kicks out Arius again. Doesn't really fix it. Then there's another council in 325 in Antioch, also called by Hosius of Cordoba, in which he is now in a different city, he's in Antioch, and he condemns Arius again, and at this council, he excommunicates Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius is a very famous guy to us. I don't think he was so famous to them yet because he wrote the church history. But he had already done that. And he had already established himself as like a superstar originist scholar. His teacher was Pamphilus, and Pamphilus' teacher was Origen. So like Eusebius is the steward of Origen's library. He literally owns all of Origen's books in Caesarea, and he's a steward of them. And this guy's going to kick this Eusebius out of the church. And then in 325, we have another council in Nicaea, which we'll cover next time. This is the big one. It, it deserves a lot more attention than I can give you in the time I have left. So just in the few minutes I have left, I want to talk about Arius' theology so that you understand it pretty clearly. Arius was from Libya. Sibelius was from Libya. Sibelius taught a, what they call a heresy, that the father and the son are the same. There, there's no distinction between them. It's just a difference in mode or aspect, but not a difference in being or person or anything like that. Arius is sensitive to Sibelianism because he's from that same area. So when Alexander starts talking in a way that sounds like Sibelius, Arius the Libyan, here's Sibelius the Libyan, and says, no, 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 not in my church. This, this, is not, this is not how we roll. This is not the doctrine. This is not what we learned. 
Arius may not have thought much about this subject until Alexander started asking these questions and preaching this one particular idea. But once Arius did start thinking about it, he's a logician. If you are begotten, you have a beginning. If you have a beginning, you didn't exist before your beginning. Like it's perfect logic. You can't even argue with it. And so Arius is trying to preserve tradition, but he's also trying to communicate what he's saying. And he does innovate a little bit in that he says that the son was begotten ex nihilo, from nothing. And this phrase, the idea that the son is, is, is begotten or created from nothing, is used a lot by his enemies to sort of like be an outlandish statement that nobody would ever believe. The son is obviously begotten from the father, not from nothing, right? So Arius gets, gets himself in a little bit of trouble there, but he doubles down and he pushes it and pushes it and pushes it. Arius was concerned about the tradition. He thinks of himself as a conservative, and his, his view did innovate in a couple of ways, but he still thinks of himself as a conservative. His main point, however, that the Father is greater than the Son and that the Father is eternal and the Son is not, this is not a new idea. This is not something that he invented. RPC Hansen puts it this way. There is no theologian, look, a historian of this guy's caliber, for him to say an absolute like this, it's a big statement. There is no theologian in the Eastern or Western Church before the outbreak of the Arian controversy who does not, in some sense, regard the Son as subordinate to the Father. Literally everybody. In fact, I was reading one of Alexander's letters. He's a subordinationist. This, is the, this is guy is supposed to be like the Trinitarian guy. There's no Trinity yet. Like he's, he's working on something that is going to be indispensable to the Trinity, but we're not, we're not there yet. That's another few decades off. He still thinks that because the Father is unbegun, that the Father is superior to the Son. He says it in his letter. He just thinks the Son is eternal too, and he is fully God, but in a derived sense, not in an original sense. So it's, it's not as clear and cut and dry as you might think. Arius wrote a poem called the Thalia. We don't know for sure that Arius called it the Thalia or his critics called it the Thalia, but the, the word Thalia means abundance or festivity. I mean, it's, a, it's a happy word, so it's possible. And it's written in a very rhythmic sense. So anyhow, this is just a little quote from it, just so you have a flavor of a little bit more of this. And it's a little repetitious of what we've already seen, but this is like really all that survives. Anything that I've quoted to you about Arius of his own words has been preserved by his enemies who quote him and then disprove him. So this is like from his enemies' quotes because nobody's going to bother to copy anything Arius ever wrote after this because he loses. The victors write the history. Arius writes, According to the faith of the chosen ones of God, the knowledgeable children of God, the holy orthodox ones who have received the spirit of the holy God, I have learnt these things from those who share wisdom. Smart people taught of God and wise in every way. In the steps of these I have come. I, going along with them, I, the well-known, who have suffered much for the glory of God. I, I want to point out here, what is he trying to say? He's trying to say that he's not inventing this. He learned this from other people. What kind of people? People that are wise and smart, people that have been taught by God, holy orthodox people. He's thinking of himself as a steward of a deposit of faith, of a rule of faith, taught by Orthodox people who came before him. He continues, Who have learnt wisdom from God, and I know knowledge. God then himself is in essence ineffable to all. He alone has neither equal nor like, none comparable in glory. We call him unbegotten. That's one of the big buzzwords here. Because of the one in nature begotten. We raise hymns to him as unbegun because of him who has a beginning. We adore her, him as eternal because of the one born in time. You see how he's drawing the contrast between the Father and the Son? The unbegun appointed the Son to be beginning of things begotten and bore him as his own Son, in this case, giving birth. 
He has nothing proper to God in his essential property, for neither is he equal nor yet consubstantial with him. This consubstantial word we're going to look at next time, but that's the big buzzword on the other side, on Alexander's side of the fence. So his slogans were, he was made from what was not. That's one of Arius' slogans. He was not before he was born, and there was when he was not, which I think is the most rhythmic of all of them in English, at least. You know, these things in Greek, I'm sure, sound awesome, but, you know, we're kind of missing out some of it in English here. Two books that you want to get that I want to recommend to you if you're interested in this controversy. There is not a better book on planet Earth than The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God by R.P.C. Hansen. It is the most thorough, epic treatment it covers the whole controversy from 318 to 381. It's massive. It's hard. It's written in technical. I mean, it's English, but like, you know, he's a super scholarly guy. And he is in touch with the sources, not just the primary sources in English, but in their original languages, and often even translates himself. Massive tome. He covers everything. And he's very honest, which I love. I really appreciate that. If you are not feeling up to reading such a long book, you can read a shorter one by Richard Rubenstein. Richard Rubenstein based his book on R.P.C. Hansen's book and some other sources, but his is called When Jesus Became God, The Epic Fight Over Christ's Divinity in the Last Days of Rome. So if you're interested in the Trinitarian controversy, what happened with Arius and Alexander, and then the aftermath, which we're going to get to next time, I would recommend these two books. Let's review. Bishop Alexander of Alexandria began teaching that the Son of God was eternal, although he didn't teach that he was equal with God. It's interesting. Presbyter Arius objected, teaching instead that because the Son of God was begotten, there was a time when he was not. After multiple debates, Alexander held a council and insisted Arius sign his confession or face excommunication. Arius refused. When Alexander ejected Arius from the churches in Alexandria, 89 others left with him, including clergy. Eusebius of Nicomedia and Eusebius of Caesarea tried to convince Alexander to reinstate Arius. Alexander wrote letters to bishops around the world, warning them not to accept Arius or those who believed like him. Although both Alexander and Arius were subordinationists, Alexander believed God was only greater than his son and that he was unbegun, though both were eternal. I still, even though I wrote that sentence, I still don't quite know how you make sense of that. (laughs) Uh, But in his letter, he will say he is only greater in the sense that he's unbegun. And it's like, if the son is eternal, doesn't that mean he's unbegun as well? (laughs) But uh, no, it means he's begotten eternally. Arius believed God's begetting of the Son was a creative act, though the Son was still supreme over other creatures. Arius did not invent the idea that the Son had a beginning, but his insistence that the Son was made from nothing instead of from God was new. Alexander's heavy-handed tactics polarized churches on this issue, resulting in Emperor Constantine's involvement. Next week, we'll look at what happens next when the emperor says, all right, let's have the first global conference of bishops. Let's invite everybody. All the, all the leaders, we'll get them all together at my summer palace in Nicaea. We'll pay for it. We'll fund it by the, the government of the empire. We'll, we'll use the, the, the horses that we use to, to move mail around. We'll move bishops around. We'll get them all there. It'll be a thousand people all in a couple hundred bishops and all their attendants and and, and other folks that are needful to have this event happen, and we will fix this issue. We will come to a decision, and we will stand by that decision for all time. It was a wonderful dream, but we'll have to wait until next time to see what happens as we continue in our journey through early church history. Well, that brings this episode to a close. What'd you think? Come on over to restitutio.org, find episode 494, Arius and Alexander of Alexandria, and leave your feedback there. We'd love to hear what you have to say. On our last episode on the Constantinian shift, David wrote in, 
What with everyone blaming Constantine for everything, it's easy to miss the incredible changes that actually shifted the Christian world on its axis when the Roman world chose to embrace the church instead of destroying it. That move changed everything. I totally agree. I mean, it's a very complicated situation how the church was going to deal with Constantine, whether the church was going to embrace Constantine or uh, hold him at arm's length or provisionally accept his involvement, but also holding back allegiance. I, I don't know exactly what the best course of action would have been at the time. All I know is looking back on it, this is the moment where the church begins the process of merging with the state that eventually ends with all kinds of problems. Now, some have reacted negatively to my statements about Charlemagne, about the Crusades, and about the Nazis in the Holocaust, saying that it's unfair for me to put all this on Constantine and the church's response and embracing him with open arms and and willingly allowing the state into the church to really uh, dictate theology, as we'll see in our next episode, but also to uh, change the standards of what Christ said was right and wrong. Uh, And I I hear that. You know, I don't want to blame Constantine for every future thing that's ever happened with the church-state merger called Christendom. But as a historian, I have to look back at it and say, well, look, this is the this is the turn in the road whose trajectory ended with the Holocaust. And people say, well, how, how, how are you going to say the Holocaust had anything to do with this? And the reason why I bring up the Holocaust is not because I want to blame Christianity for the Holocaust, but I, I will say this. The majority of the Germans who participated in the Holocaust consider themselves Christians and also rejected the teaching of Jesus that they're supposed to love their enemies. Where did that mutation first occur? It first occurred with the church in the 4th century as they cozied up to the state and got away from the teachings of Jesus that are radical, that are difficult to follow, that are centered in love. You don't see Jesus murdering the Jews. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing that could ever happen. And yet these people later on, who were quote-unquote nominal Christians, part of a state church in Germany— when ordered by the the commander of the government, which is also the commander of the church, they did obey and they did persecute and murder many of the Jewish people. And if you don't think that there was some sort of twisted Christian rhetoric involved in that whole situation, then you really need to look at the history again. Now, I don't want to blame Christ for the Holocaust. I think Christ stood against the Holocaust and any other sort of violence in that regard, because he taught us, once again, to love our enemies. Uh, But the problem is the church mutated. The church got away from that, and the end of that road did lead to the wholesale genocide of other people, and not just in Germany, and not just during World War II. There There have been other incidents as well. And as Christians of the 21st century, we cannot stick our head in the sand and be like, oh, well, they weren't real Christians. Okay, I agree. They weren't real Christians, but why is that a thing? Why is it that they're, that people call themselves Christians and they don't follow Jesus? Hmm, the Constantinian shift. So that's really the most of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, maybe I've overstepped. Uh, you have to let me know in the comments on this episode. Uh, or join the Facebook group and find Restitutio there and leave your comments there as well. It's a pretty happening place. Uh, or you can follow me on Twitter at Restitutio SF is my username. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, that's it for today. Next time, we're getting into the nitty-gritty of the Council of Nicaea and all the following councils that eventually led up to the Council of Constantinople in 381. So we're really covering that period, 325 to 381, which is the period that everyone's so interested in. Let's be honest. Uh, So stay tuned for that next week. If you'd like to support this ministry, you could do that at restitutio.org. Thanks to all of you who are supporting us. It makes a big difference. We'll catch you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.